was about 10 years old, I held my mother's hand as she died from lymphoma. And two of her brothers also died from cancer, one from melanoma and the other one from lung cancer. And then uh, just about 10 years ago, I held my brother's hand while he, he died from metastatic prostate cancer. And so having seen that and seen the treatments, my mother got radiation, my uncle got chemotherapy. Um, I've always just felt there's got to be a better way. Is that still a part of your, of your driving force and, and motivation? Absolutely, absolutely. I would really like to, I would really like to do what we can to really cure some cancers at least. You've got probably around 50 million different T cells with different receptors. It's like the ignition switch in the car. Um, and when they see the right thing, you know, that turns that on, uh, that it tells them that there's something out there that they need to go look at. And so there may only be a, a dozen or so of any particular type. Well, in order to be effective, you've got to get hundreds of thousands of them. And so those cells, when they get, when they're activated, start dividing like crazy and they may divide every six hours or so, because what you need is a couple of hundred thousand cells in a period of, le or more, in, the le in less than a week. And so the cells divide like crazy. And so the idea used to be that you see the signal, T cells expand to their thing, and they die as a consequence of being activated. It turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and the first thing is that uh, people have known since the late 80s is that is that recognition of antigen is, is not sufficient, much like in a car turning on the ignition switch may start the motor, but you're not going to go anywhere. So with T cells, there's a second signal called a co-stimulatory signal that they need, and only a very specialized kind of cell can provide that. And so only when the T cell gets both of those does it, do you start that program. And so people realize that, you know, in fact, we identified the receptor of uh, those co-stimulatory signals, there's a molecule called CD28. And, uh, but still the question was with those two, how do you stop it? Well, again, what everybody thought was, well, they just die when they outlive their usefulness. But that wasn't very satisfying, you know, because of a lot of reasons. But it turned out that there's a molecule called CTLA-4 that's structurally very sim similar to CD28 and it's, the gene for that was cloned way before I worked with CD28. It was this molecule, nobody knew what it did, except that it wasn't in cells until after activation. And at first people thought it was another CD28, it was another co-stimulatory molecule. Uh, and that was in the textbooks and everything. Uh, and, uh, but we started looking at that and, and uh, I realized that the experiments that had been done could not distinguish between that molecule or antibodies against it, you know, being involved in providing another positive signal or removing a negative signal. And so uh, we undertook, graduate student in my lab, uh, and I took, undertook a series of experiments to really show that it really was the second. It was that CTLA-4 is a negative molecule, and its job is when a T cell gets activated, and you turn on through CD28 this go pathway that says, you know, divide and go out there and kill the bad guys. You also start this off pathway. You turn on the CTLA-4 gene, and with time it accumulates and stops the process because it blocks what the binding of CD28 to the things that give it a signal. And uh, so that's, that's the basic thing. The molecule seems to pr protect you against your own immune system. From the beginning, this is basic research. How important is the, the step from basic research to, to applications for you? Well, it, was, it wasn't a very long step, but I think that uh, what I'd like to stress is that basic research is absolutely fundamental. I mean, this, this whole idea came out of fundamentals. Again, it wasn't trying to cure cancer, it was trying to learn how T cells work. And then once you understand that, trying to apply that to cancer. So I can't 
speak strongly enough about how important basic research is. There's a tendency now, I think, for certain in the United States, for people to do translational research. My own feeling is everybody, if everybody's doing translational research, pretty soon there'll be nothing to translate because there won't be any new ideas coming out. And translational research, by definition, only lets you take tiny steps. Whereas, you know, you find something new in basic research and you can take that big leap. And, uh, but I guess in part because I'm an immunologist and the immune system is so close to diseases and things, it was a very small step to go to the, you know, the cancer application. To, to uh, change the subject completely, you're, you're a part of a band called Checkpoint playing the harmonica, right? I started playing it probably when I was in junior high school. I don't know. I just always played and had a lot of fun. And then when I was a postdoc in, in uh, La Jolla, California, uh, I ran into some guys there from, from Texas that had a country and western man. So I used to play with them for about two years. I played with them once a week. And uh, then uh, at, a, at a scientific conference one time, somebody said, everybody bring, can play an instrument, bring your instrument. And so uh, several of us did. It turned out that it's a fellow named Tom Gajewski, who's head of cancer immunotherapy at the University of Chicago, and a guy named Patrick Hu, who's was the similar position at, at NMD Anderson. Plays, Tom plays guitar and really leads the man now. And Patrick plays keyboards. And I play, so that was sort of the nucleus. And then over the years, more and, peop, more and more people have come in. So now we've got a vocalist and rhythm guitar and drummer and a, and a bass player and a trombone player and a saxophone player. And, but everybody in the band is, is involved in, in cancer research. Yes. And Checkpoint is because of the... Of the immune checkpoint, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't play as much as I used to just sitting around the house, but uh, yeah, I used to play with records. And, and one of the, I, a few months ago, I got to fulfill a, a dream, uh, well, actually a year ago. One of my favorite singers for a long time is, is Willie Nelson. I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, I, I mean, I think he's just a magical guy. He's getting old, on in years now, but I met him one time when I, he, was, we were, he was in his 40s, I was in my 20s. Uh, but I played with, I was invited to play with him in a club in Houston about a year and a half ago, and then I was invited to sit in with him this past October at a festival called the Austin City Limits Festival in Austin. And uh, I walked out and just played one song with him, but there were 70,000 people in the audience. And that was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's one of those, you know, goals that I've had. I know that you've met patients that actually uh, are alive thanks to your research. How does that feel? The first time, very good. The first I met, the first one I met was uh, a woman named Sharon. I can say that because she is kind of a motivational speaker now, Sharon Belvin. She, uh, well, anyway, the way it happened was I was in my office in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering one day, and a colleague and friend of mine, uh, Jed Walchuk, called me and said, come down to the outpatient clinic. I said, Jed, I'm busy. And he said, no, just come down here. And he, you know, he wouldn't tell me why or anything. So, you know, I walked down. It was about six blocks away. And I walked down there looking for him. And they said, oh, he's in room 5A or whatever. And I walked in, and here he was there with this woman. And what turned out to be her husband and her parents. And uh, she was very tall, very, very big woman. She went over and hugged me and picked me up. She's him, much taller than me, and uh, and uh, everybody started crying. You know, she was crying. Her husband was. Everybody. I started crying. You know, and uh, and uh, it, it was quite an emotional moment. You know, because a lot of the early experiments I was involved in, like I said, you know, the mice just bite you. You know, they don't <laughs> they don't care that you cured them. Of course, they may be aware that we gave them the tumor in the first place. I don't know, but. No, but it, it, was, it was tremendous. And, and, and with Sharon, the thing is that I've, we've kept up for many years. And uh, she had been diagnosed when she was about 24 years old, anyway, in her mid-20s. She had just finished college, just gotten married. She had melanoma in her liver, in her lungs, in her brain. She would failed everything. And, uh, you know, she was basically hospice-bound when she got these tumors had gone completely away a year before, and this was when she was back for her first year checkup. And um, later on, I talked to her, and it, you know, each year when she came back, she was afraid, but after 
I think about three years, she decided to have a kid. So she sent me a photo of her baby. And then a couple of years later, of her second baby. And now they're about, what, eight and 10, something like that. And uh, every now and then I get a photo of the whole family. And uh, it's really, that's what it's about. You, you, but you had this, this uh, what shall I call it, this part of your motivation or all your, your life in a way. Yeah. yeah. And I can see you, you move now when you, when you talk about it. I can understand that. Yeah, until I met Sharon though, to me, despite my family, you know, I would see numbers, I'd see graphs, but she was the first person. Since then I met many, as you said, but meeting that first patient and realizing this is, you know, not just numbers on a piece of paper, these are people's lives. The thing is, now we know what the basic rules are, and we know it can be done. You know, and the question is, can we do it in every kind of cancer? I doubt it, but that's that's the goal. I mean, that's our goal now, is to, you know, come up with. You can draw a survival curve, you know, which percent people percent people versus time, and with really invasive cancers, it goes down with a half life of I don't know two to three years or something. We know with anacetyl A4, you can move that over about three or four months. When it gets down to 20%, it goes flat, stays there for 10 years. You know, maybe we might find that with the combination of anacetyl A4 and anapd one it's gonna come down to 50% and stay there 10 years. What we need to do is get that from 50% up as close to 100% as we can, and then start working on doing that with other cancers. And so that's the new goal, is not to move that median over the goal isn't anymore to come up with a drug and treat a thousand people and your statistics to see if the median survival has increased and then treat people and say, well, maybe you'll be in the, no, it's to, I think, should be to start raising the tail of the curve up as high as we can get it. In.